When I was a pastor in Houston years ago, we would break up into small groups in all sorts of different places. We would have it. I was in a small group with two or three people, and one of them was a guy who had been around our church forever. He had grown up in the church. He had been a part of the leadership of the church. He was there in this small group, and uh, the question was, what was one thing you need to learn uh, about the Christian life? And we went around the circle, and he said this. It was sort of surprising to me. I guess it shouldn't be in retrospect, but it was this. He goes, I don't know how to pray. Now, he had been an elder. He had been a part of our worship committee. He had been a part of all these different things. He said, I don't know how to pray. So in good small group fashion, anyone said, everyone said, oh, I hear you. Nobody responded by answering the question, of course. And uh, we, afterwards, I pulled him aside and said, let's go to coffee. And when we talked about it, he really was perplexed by this whole thing. What do, what do I do? What do I say? What's in my head? How am I to pray out loud? What am I to do with all this? He had been around the Christian faith for a long time, and many of you may be feeling that. I've been around the Christian faith a long time, but I really don't know how to pray. Well, here was my word to him, and I think it's Jesus' word to him. The, the, the prayer book that teaches you how to pray is already in your head, okay? It's already in your head if you have memorized the Lord's Prayer. Here we're going to go, and Jesus is going to teach us a prayer. And it's a model prayer for us, and it's simply, as we break it down, beginning to understand the component parts so that when we pray, we begin to understand how Jesus would teach us to pray. In fact, while this is embedded in the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus taught this again in the book of Luke, it was in response to the disciples coming and asking him this question, Lord, how are we supposed to pray? And at that point, he began to teach the prayer that you know. And the Lord's Prayer then can be a, an important lesson for us. It can be something that's there that helps us to understand and know how to pray. And so we want to look at it today in context. We're going to begin with verse 9 and of chapter 6, and we're going to go through 15. So if you would, put it up on the screen, and let's begin to look at it. Jesus said this, Pray then in this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Thus ends the reading of God's word. Thanks be to God. When we look at this passage, we realize it's very familiar to us. In fact, oftentimes when you ask people about the Lord's Prayer, they won't even realize that it came out of Scripture. They just thought the church made it up, perhaps, or something like that. It was taught, and everybody has a different response to the Lord's Prayer. For some of you, having grown up Catholic, it was a punishment that was given to you after confession, right? I want you to say, 30 our fathers. And uh, so, so your relationship to this prayer is one that, if you're saying it, it's probably because you did something bad, you hit your sister, or something like that, Right? But the, the, the response of Jesus when he wants to teach this really has some profound power to it. It begins like this, our Father. Now that would have been a radical statement at the time when the people who are listening to it, they all knew how to pray. And when Jesus did this, he said something remarkable. He said, our Father. In fact, the word really is translated in Aramaic, Abba, which is the word that we would use uh, for dad. Something very familiar. It's the word you would use when you're, when you're coming in and you're part of a household and you become so familiar. I mean, we use all sorts of words. In fact, every culture has one of these words that's not the formal use, but the informal use that shows the relationship between there. It might be Papa or it might be something like that. But it's that use of Abba that was important here because it says, Our Father, 
But the radical nature of what Jesus is teaching about our relationship with God is found right there. Right there. This week, as you know, uh, we had another Coulter wedding. It seems to happen all the time. I, I don't, I don't, someday, someday it's going to end, but uh, I, I think it's over now. Kim hasn't told me yet, but I, I think it's over now. We had two of our kids get married this spring. It's really been a year of weddings. We uh, had almost a year ago the engagement, the first engagement, and in the fall, the second engagement, two weddings. And uh, one of the awkward things about this, and if those of you who are married, or, or those of you who are engaged will know this, is, is when you're engaged or when, you're, when you become part of a, an extended family, what do you call the parents of your fiancé? Right? That's, that's one of those kind of awkward things. I mean, you know, so Natalie, who is Josh's wife now, I said that well, didn't I? Natalie, who is Josh's wife now, uh, you know, used to call me Mr. Coulter, and then their relationship started to grow, and I said at one point, you can call me Larry, right? And she said, oh, okay, and she couldn't quite get it off her lips. I mean, everybody else around her, including all her friends at college and everything else in that Young Life Circle were calling me Larry, but she couldn't call me that, so she started calling me Reverend. Now, nobody else in the world calls me Reverend, so she was, it was sort of a term of endearment. And she would say, how are you, Reverend? And, I, you know, and so really, literally, over the last year, she's been calling me Reverend. And then what happened was, last week, we walked down the aisle, because I was doing the service, and we walked to the back just before we go to pictures, and I came over and I greeted them and congratulated them, and she said, I guess I can call you dad now, right? I guess I can call you dad now. You see, there had been a transfer of familiarity there, and what Jesus does with this prayer is he transfers that familiarity that he has with the Heavenly Father to us, and he says, when you pray, pray in this way, our Father. And for many of us, we may say, oh, that's too familiar. And yet Jesus is giving us the ability to do that. He said, Abba. And he says, I want you to pray in that way as well. Abba, our Father. Now for many, many, this is really troublesome. Because they grew up in a household where their father was not the kind of person that they had warm affections for. And many of you have experienced that. And I get that. In fact, there, there was a strong movement in the last 40 years to change much of the male imagery for God. And yet you have to hear at the core of this, that regardless of what our earthly father was like, when we come to this, it redefines the nature of father. It redefines it to what a heavenly father is. And that's one of great grace and love and acceptance. And Jesus wants to draw us into that. And so he starts it in that way. He says, our Father. And then he gives us ten small lessons that I want you to see as we work through the, the Lord's Prayer. Did I say ten? Six. <laughs> wow, I don't know where that came from. Six small lessons, okay? <laughs> three of them have to do with God, and three of them have to do with us, Okay? And as we walk through, we're going to hear that. Our Father, who art in heaven, and the first one is this, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. It means holy is your name. It is beginning to assign a responsibility to God over my life that will be carried out until we talk about our will. He says, you are the one who gives life. You are the one who gives meaning. You are the one who gives purpose. It starts with that. I know last week when Britta talked up here, she talked about that journey for her when she, she had to go and she had to begin to realize that much of her prayer life was in asking and she had to move to that point where she had to learn how to simply give praise. And Jesus starts his prayer like that. So if you want to know how to pray, he starts with our Father, transferring that over to us. And then he begins to teach us what it means to say, Lord, you are the one who gives me meaning. Do you know why that's important? 
it's important for us to remind ourselves of that truth. Because everything in our world and our culture says meaning comes from all sorts of different places. Meaning comes from what you buy. Meaning comes from what you do. Meaning comes from your family. Meaning comes from all sorts of different places. But here in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus transfers that and says, oh no, meaning comes from you, Lord. And he says this, hallowed be thy name. And then he comes in and teaches us the second thing. For if we're focusing on God, we then begin to focus on his kingdom and not our own. And he says this, your kingdom what? Come, right? He says, your kingdom come. And when he begins to talk about his kingdom, we realize that it's an important lesson for us. Let me talk about a kingdom. We've talked about it in here. A kingdom is the place where your will is effectively operative. Now, let me just unpack that a little bit. In other words, your will is effectively operative. For me, my will is effectively operative in my home. In other words, when I do it, oh, you're saying it's not. <laughs> it is since everybody's left, <laughs> right? But it's effectively operative in my home. It works. My will works out in my home. And let me just tell you why I know that. Did I do, if I do something that's damaging to one of my kids or to my wife, it affects everybody. If my will begins to be operative there, it affects everybody. My will is effective in my home. That's my kingdom. But my kingdom extends farther than that. My, extending, my kingdom extends to my work as well. And part of my work is you. And that means that I, if I act out and use my power or my strength in some way that's destructive, you know who it affects? You. You ever been in a church where the pastor uses their power poorly? You know how it affects the congregation. It breaks down community. It doesn't work, right? Because that's my kingdom. And for you, you have a kingdom as well. Think about it. Think about the extent of your kingdom. And here's how you can tell. The extent of your kingdom is who would be effective, who would be affected if you did something that was destructive to either you or somebody else? Who would be affected? Well, immediately you think my family would be, my friends might be, my work might be. You see, that's the effective part of your will that has worked. Now, I know that's conceptual. I want you to think about it. Here's my kingdom. You'll all have a kingdom. And Jesus is saying this. In my prayer, I remind myself that my kingdom as a Christian has been transferred to his kingdom. It's not my will that's operative here. It's God's will. And I have to remind myself because I keep taking it back. I keep holding it out to God, but as soon as God begins to take it, I take it back. Instead of saying my family is the place where my will is active, I say, Lord, may my family be the place where your will is active. And here would be the question attached to that. Have you begun to transfer your will under God's will? He says, my, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Jesus did this as well. In fact, in Philippians chapter 2, it talks about how he took on a humble nature and he began to receive that, so he became obedient to God. You see that in the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember that story? He said this, Lord, if it's possible, take this cup from me. All that's about to happen, all the going to the cross, all the other stuff, if it's possible, take it away. A heartfelt prayer. And then he says this, but not my will, but thy will be done. And he took it and he began to move his kingdom under God's kingdom and God's rule. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You see, those three lessons of, of God's kingdom moving it under our will, moving it under him, all is a part of what Jesus wanted to teach us when we pray. So the question is, how do we pray? Well, we start with our position before God. 
We start with that. For most of us, our prayers don't start with that. They simply start with what we need to ask for. Lord, I need a parking place. Lord, you need to, you know, you need to convince my wife that she's wrong. Lord, you need, whatever it may be, it's all sorts of things that we go to ask God for. But Jesus never started there. You want to know how to pray? Start with God. Lord, I pray that your kingdom will be first. That hallowed would be your name. Your name would be holy in my life. That my will would come under your will. He teaches that first. But then he turns the corner. And he begins to talk about three other things, three additional things that give us a playbook for our prayers. The first one is this. Give us this day our daily bread. You know what? It's a bare essentials, right? Give us this day our daily bread. I was teaching on this a number of years ago, and a woman said to me, oh, I never pray for myself, right? I never pray for myself. I only pray for other people. And I say, well, that's interesting. That's not how Jesus taught it, but that's interesting, right? He taught us to pray for our own needs. Give us this day our daily bread is a primary prayer for my own needs. So people come and say, well, what can I pray for? And here's what I tell them. Pray the desires of your heart. Pray the desires of your heart. But always pray it with the first part of this prayer in mind. But not my will, but your will be done. So when you find yourself wondering, can I pray for that? The answer is yes. In fact, I learned this because of being a father. You know, there are many times where I would come home and I would sit in this leather chair that we have and I would start to read a little bit and my kids would come in when they were really little and they would begin to climb on me. Does this ever happen in your house? They would begin to climb on me and they would do things to me that no other human being got to do. They would pull on my hair and they would pull on my ears and they would do all those things. And you know what? I didn't mind. Because they had access to me because I was their dad, right? And they had access to me. And here's what they would do inevitably. Dad, can we? And they would ask me. And never did I say, it is not right for you to ask me that. Now, many times I would say, no. <laughs> and many times I'd say, maybe. And many times I'd say, yes, but they were never afraid to ask me. And Jesus wants to drive us into that and say, come to me. Come to me with your prayers. There was a young woman uh, whom I was talking to a while back, and I said, tell me, tell me what, what you want in life next. She had gotten her job. She would gotten out of college. And she said, I really want to meet somebody and marry them. And she was being real honest with me. She wouldn't tell that to anybody else. And I said this, are you praying about that? Oh, oh no. I said, well, let me tell you, Jesus teaches you to. And I would really encourage you to if that's the desire of your heart. Now, recognizing that Jesus' answer may be no. It may be not yet. It may be Yes. But as you pray, you begin to get in touch with the Heavenly Father. He teaches us to pray for ourselves. The second thing he teaches us is this. He says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So if he's teaching us how to pray, he teaches us about God, he teaches us about praying for our, our, our needs, and then he teaches us about asking for forgiveness. You know, each week in our, in our worship service, we have a prayer of confession, and we do that not just haphazardly because it's there, but it's because we believe Jesus taught us to do that, right? And corporately, we come together and we say, Lord, forgive us any time that we strayed from you in order to bring us back into your fold. This is the only one of these teachings that Jesus runs a commentary on, and it's a hard commentary. He says this, if you're not willing to forgive others, then God won't forgive you as well. Now, it would take us a long time to unpack that, and we don't have the time today. But I want you to understand that Jesus took this seriously. Because he took it seriously that we have a social responsibility to forgive others. 
And if we have a spiritual privilege that God forgives us, we have a social responsibility that we are to forgive others. And Jesus ties those two together very strongly. And there'll be other times when we'll begin to unpack that a little bit because that may raise issues for you. For some of you, you've been hurt very badly by somebody else. And you don't know how to forgive that other person. And I understand that and I get that. But I just want you to know and I want you to rest in this, that Jesus says that his forgiveness is there for us. In fact, that's why he died on the cross, so that we might come to him and experience that forgiveness that is there. But he taught it and he prefaced it by that Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our debts. The final thing is he said, lead us not into temptation, lead us not to evil is how it's translated. Now you'll notice at the end of this prayer, it doesn't give us, for thine is the kingdom and the power. It doesn't. You know why? Because it wasn't in the original manuscript. It was added in the second century to sort of tie the prayer together. Jesus didn't pray that part of the Lord's Prayer, and yet we include it in there. Do I believe it's an important part of the prayer? Absolutely. But Jesus ended on this note, and he said, he said lead us not into temptation. If, if the first, give us our, this day our daily bread, is a prayer for the present, and if forgive us as we forgive others is a prayer for the past, so I'd load the baggage, then this is a prayer for the, pre- this is a prayer for the future. Lord, may all my life come under you so that the evil that has happened to me might be let go and the future might be such that it's transformed by your spirit so that I don't walk into evil as well. Jesus wanted to teach us how to pray. My friend all those years ago had it there in his head and you do as well. It's a prayer model that Jesus wanted to teach you and he wanted to make it a part of your life. This week, here's what I'd like you to think about. If I could begin to pray that prayer and write it down in my own words, what would I say? Just just like Chris challenged the kids to do that, this is something you might want to learn to do. You see, it'll go far in teaching you how to further your spiritual life with Jesus Christ to begin to learn how to pray. We start with God and we end with our life with God. And in doing so, God takes us into the next step in our journey as we walk as prayerful people. Let's pray together. Oh, Father, you are in heaven and your name is holy. I am thankful for your kingdom and may it come true in my life and my family's life and the life of our congregation and, Lord, indeed, the world. And may that come true by our will being transferred under your will so that your kingdom is the operative kingdom, not mine. Because every time I take it on, my power begins to destroy, not to build up. So Lord, today I pray that you not only give us our, our food to eat, but you also begin to extend that love to others. May we be gracious givers so that others might have food as well. And Lord, forgive us our sins, but also, Lord, may we do that with others as well. In the future, Lord, we want our life to be lived for you. So we pray this prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven,